যেখানে আপনার welcome back everyone now we shall start our first keynote talk entitled Statistical Learning with Sparsity by Professor Trevor Hesty of Stanford University. And to chair the session, I would like to request Professor Popa Probal Chowdhury of Indian Statistical Institute to please come on stage and chair the session for us. Thank you. I will introduce you. Yes, sir. I will just introduce you. So I can start. I can start. Yes, sir. Very good morning to all of you and welcome to the first keynote address and the first technical session of the conference. It's an honor to chair a session by one of the leading personalities in the area of statistics and machine learning. I remember when I was a PhD student, totally before that, one of the few buzzwords were generalized linear model. Then Trevor, along with his co-author, Rob Tupshilani, did generalized additive model, and that became the new buzzword, generalized additive model. And now he is here going to talk about sparsity and lasso, which is one of his greatest creation. And I don't think there is anybody in the audience who hasn't heard about lasso. So the impact of his work is tremendous in terms of application and uh, its usefulness. So Professor Trevor Hesty is the John A. Overtake Professor of Statistics at Stanford University. He's known for his research in applied statistics, particularly in the fields of statistical modeling, bioinformatics, and machine learning. He has published seven books and over 200 research articles in these areas. Prior to joining Stanford University in 1994, Trevor worked at AT&T Bell Labs for nine years where he contributed to the development of statistical modeling environment popular in the R computing system. He received a BSc honors in statistics from Rhodes University in 1976, an MSc from University of Cape Town in 1979 and a PhD from Stanford in 1984. He was a student of another famous statistician, Larry Friedman. 
He is currently dual citizen of both United States and South Africa. There is a list of awards here, and uh, instead of mentioning each and every one here, that will encroach into his presentation. I think people here are all eagerly waiting to uh, listen to his talks. So I will just mention one or two from here. So he was elected to the US National Academy of Sciences, which is one of the greatest honor in the United States. And then he has received honorary doctorate from several universities all over the world. And some of his uh, recent achievements, uh, he was elected to the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science. And he is the recipient of Senior Bryman Award of American Statistical Association and the Honorary Doctor of Mathematics, University of Waterloo, Canada. So, Trevor, the stage is yours now. Well, then I can see it better. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Pogo. And hello, everyone. Um, thank you for, for attending the session. It's a big honor to give the first talk in this in this conference. And and this is um, this is work that uh, you'll see. It's 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 based on um, a lot of collaboration with colleagues. Mm -hmm. So um, before I start, GPT is of course um, a, a real buzzword to go. Um, Today, I was told that since this is an AI conference, that if I did not talk about uh, GPT, I would be a loser. So I had to do a little search on the internet. Uh, so this is what's happened. <laughs> and uh, you know, I do love to, but I'm not an expert, so I'll just talk about uh, sparsity instead. So this is a book. Um, that I wrote with Rob Tipsharani and Martin Wainwright. Rob Tipsharani, of course, was the inventor of the lasso. And a lot of the, the book was essentially built around the lasso and with lots of different applications. Um, it also involved a lot of collaboration with Brad Efron, um, Jerry Friedman, and my colleague uh, uh, Bala Subramaniam uh, Narasimhan. And then a lot of students. And so I won't mention all their names, but there's been a, a continuation of work over the years. Um, and I'll just mention that James is my one of my latest students, and uh, I'll, I'll mention him a little bit later. So we're talking about linear models for wide data, right? So for the most part, Lasso um, models like Lasso work in the context of linear models. Okay. So in the simple case of linear regression, there's a linear model, um, and but linear models pervade um, statistics, logistic regression is another example. So so here are some examples where we're going to have very wide data. So document classification, your bag of words, you've got very wide um, feature set. You might have five thousand, uh, that fifteen thousand features. Pre-trained tra transformers, which are coming up in large language models, high-dimensional feature spaces, possibly small local sample of documents for which you'd like to train uh, a linear classifier in that um, feature space. Gene expression and, and genome-wide association studies, this is an area that we've been working on right now. You can have a million SNPs, which are features, um, usually three-level factors, um, and not all of them are involved in a disease and you want to find a, a small subset. Um, linear models are really good in that context. And, and also, uh, I mentioned web activity. So in examples like this, we like to use linear models, <clears throat> such as linear regression, logistic regression, and the Cox model. But since in our statistics language, P is much bigger than N, P the number of variables, N the number of samples, we cannot fit these models using just standard linear regression. So we use various forms of, of regularization. Um, so I'll just explain this in the context of, of least squares for linear model, uh, for, for linear models. So forward stepwise is a form of regularization. You don't include all the variables, you just 
in a forward fashion, include the variables that are more important in terms of your objective, right? And usually select, and that'll create a path of, of models and you have to decide which one. And then of course, rich regression's been around for a long time. Rich regression, you put all the variables in the model, but you shrink their coefficients down towards zero. And the amount, the more you shrink them, the more, the more regularized the model is. Because again, you can't fit the model without any regularization, there's too many features. Okay, and then we have lasso regression. You know, so this again was uh, introduced by Rob Tipsharani in 1996, and it looks very similar to Ridge. It fits the model subject to the constraint that the sum of absolute values of the coefficients is less than some bound t, and you compare it to, to Ridge regression, where the sum of squares is less than t. So a very subtle difference, but it has a big impact. Because what you see here is that the constraint region for the lasso has got sharp corners. And that means as you, these are contours of the objective. And when you touch a constraint region, you can sometimes, you often will touch on forms or edges. And that implies that some coefficients are exactly zero. And whereas for ridge regression, there's no corners. So all the coefficients are non-zero. So with lasso, you control the variance by shrinking down towards zero. In the same time, you select variables. So that's the beauty of the lasso, and that's why it's become so popular. And it really has, for Rob um, Tipsharani's um, 96 lasso paper, um, the last time I looked, which was October 2023, 55,000 citations um, using Google uh, Scholar. So it's a nominal success. So this is a picture I like to show. This is what we call a regularization path. In this case for Ridge, and this is for Lasso. So what I'm showing you is the size of the, the norm. Here's the L2 norm, here's the L1 norm. As we relax the penalty. Initially, all the coefficients are zero. This is the case of just eight variables, right? Um, all the coefficients are zero. Um, and then as we relax it, they grow away from zero. And then in this case, because p is less than m, you get to the least square set. The big difference, some, something similar happens with lasso, but you'll notice that initially just one variable goes becomes non-zero. And then the next one becomes non-zero. So again, these are the coefficient values. Each curve corresponds to one coefficient for one variable. And this is the amount of penalty that's been applied. And then as the last two grows, the variables jump into the model one by one. Okay. The other difference that you may notice is that the lasso coefficient profile in this case is piecewise linear. So just a, a brief history of L1 regularization. So there was a, a lot of work in the, in the early 90s um, where soft thresholding was introduced by Donahue and Johnson in the, in the context of wavelets. There's picture on his paper, similar idea in the basic pursuit paper by Chen Donahue and, and Saunders. And then these ideas were extended to many linear model settings. It sort of took off immediately. There's a new area called compressed sensing that also makes use of, of L1 regularization. So a lot of different areas. So one of the things I'm going to focus on today is fitting um, these kinds of models. Um, and when we fit the, the model, we tend to not use the bound, the bound form. We tend to use what's known as the Lagrange form. So there's an equivalence. You can either um, bound the coefficients or you can put a penalty on the coefficients and include it in the objective. That's the one. Computationally, it's, it's more convenient. So... Um, and that's for the, just the linear model. And if we do, say, for example, logistic regression, then the model, it, it's linear in the logit in the two-class problem. And then we minimize the negative log likelihood plus the, the penalty on the coefficients. And then all the other models are similar. You know, you have an objective, usually a likelihood or partial likelihood for the Cox model, which you, you add penalty. So I showed you the coefficient profile, all the coefficients growing as we relax the penalty. So that's great. You know, you, there's a whole path of solutions, 
but you typically want to pick one. You want to pick a good one. So how are we going to pick a good one? Well, one popular method is cost validation. Right? So I think you're all machine learning types and, and statisticians here, you've all heard of cost validation. Right? So the idea of, of measuring the performance of these models as you change the regularization, prediction performance in the case of cross validation, typically. And if you want to do that, you can't do it on the training data, you have to do it on left out data, test data. Cross validation is this trick for using all the training data and to have left out data. So you break the data up into say 10 folds, you train on nine tenths, predict on one tenth, and you do it again and again. So you'll have 10 different estimates of error each time. And that's what I'm showing you. This, this is approximate standard error bounds on the error. So the red curve is a prediction error on left out data. And so now you may go down to the minimum error um, and, uh, and, and pick the corresponding value of lambda, and then that's the model that you pick. And at the top, you see how many variables are selected if you pick that. And then the other, that's this vertical line over here. The other vertical line is, we, 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 we try and be more parsimonious, right? This is kind of Occam's razor thing. Um, and the, I think this was introduced in the, in the Bryman, Friedman, Olshin, and Stone card book. And we go one standard error from the minimum in terms of the error um, to the more parsimonious model, or we call that the one standard error. Okay? So that's pretty much the recipe for how we fit these models. We, the models are specified up to a tuning parameter, or maybe two, but in this case, one that allows you to build a whole path of models. And then we're going to use an intuitive of, uh, criterion like prediction performance on left out data to choose that tuning parameter. So if you're going to do that, you need to have fast algorithms for fitting these models. Because for k-fold cross-validation, we need to fit the whole path, say, 10 times, k times. Right? So you need fast algorithms. So the first breakthrough, which actually was discovered um, by my uh, esteemed colleague, Professor Brad Efron, um, was least angle regression. And the point of this was that the, I showed you that the, they call this a homotopy path. For the lasso, for squared error loss, is piecewise linear. So you can imagine if it's piecewise linear, um, in between these knots, and the knots are where the next variable comes into the model. You can exploit that. Right? You don't need to compute the, the solution everywhere. As long as you can figure out when the next one comes in, you can figure out the slopes, you can get the whole path. Turns out you can compute the whole lasso homotopy path or regularization path for the same cost as a least squares fit, a single least squares fit, same order of computation. So that was a big, that was a big breakthrough. Okay, and that just shows you basically um, how it's working. And there's a package in R called the large package least standard regression and selection package, and uh, and and that lets you do so. So you can see here at each step, that's where the knots, total knots are, and the coefficients are guaranteed to be piecewise linear in between those steps. But that's for squared error loss. Um, and a flurry of work came out once that paper came out, and we and others were trying to find piecewise linear algorithms or efficient path algorithms for a variety of other situations. And we found some, but we ran dry pretty quickly. So for example, another important model is logistic regression. Well, the coefficients aren't piecewise linear, they're piecewise smooth, um, with discontinuities at the map. So the efficiency of this algorithm basically disappeared. Okay. So, that led to a new paradigm for us for fitting these models. And that's encapsulating in our package in R called Glimnet and soon to be um, released in Python called Glimnet Pi. Um, and, and there's a bunch of contributors by now. And there's Gary Friedman, Lockheed Shirani, Naris, um, and some students, Noah Simon, 
Yun Yang Jin, Tian Tei, and my fellow student, um, Jane Tian. So the way we tackled the problem here was we're going to solve the Latour problem by coordinate descent. Okay, Coordinate descent in computer science and optimization is considered a real old-fashioned procedure. But as you, um, I hope to convince you, it's really attractive for these kinds of problems. So what you do is you, you optimize each parameter separately, holding all the others fixed. Okay, and the updates are trivial and can cycle around the coefficients for the stabilize. So look, you're going to do this on a grid of lambda values. So you're not going to get the exact path everywhere, but you're going to make a fine grid of values of lambda and get the exact solution of those values on the grid. Okay. And you're going to start at a point called lambda max. It's an important point. It'll come up later. This is the value of lambda. It's the smallest value of lambda for which all the coefficients are still zero, and everything is still shrunk to zero. And you can turn that, you can figure out lambda max trivially. It's an easy thing to find. I'll show you a bit later how we do that. So you start at lambda max, and then from then on down towards zero, everything's going to be non zero. And you make a grid of values of lambda, usually 100 on the log scale, and compute exact solutions there. Okay. Now, the other important thing is because you're making a grid, you know at the beginning everything's zero. The, the active set grows quite slowly. And so you get warm starts from one lambda as you go down to the next that are really good warm starts. And, and so you get to the next solution quite quickly. And the active set grows when you get down to the solution. So for example, we're going to do this with, with general loss function. Um, where you'd no normally use a Newton algorithm. And by doing this on a fine grid of lambda and with warm starts, you tend to stay in the quadratic part of the, of, of the, 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 of the loss function. And so you get solutions very quickly. So that becomes really important. Okay. Now it turns out coordinate descent is really fast and it gets speed ups over any other algorithm that's been trying to compete with it by factors of 100, which is a little more, 10 or 100 or more. So I'll give one example here. We, um, we had a, a, a good colleague at Stanford, Stephen Boyd, is an expert in convex optimization. And when we first came out to this package, we had a little competition with them for fitting a, a high dimensional sparse layer two problem. It was a document data set, 11,000 observations. Um, uh, Three quarters of a million features, 100 values of lambda, um, and we're doing that two logistic regression, and it took five seconds on my laptop to fit the whole part. And on, on their, um, with their fancy interior point convex optimization algorithm, it took approximately two hours. Actually, at the time we did that little bake off, I think it took us maybe 30 seconds and then two hours, and now with the new machines. So this is the picture showing that we get solutions on a grid of values of lambda. But it, uh, they are identical to what you get exactly. So, so we use a, this package was developed in R, and so we can just limit package parameters in R. And so just me rushing some of the features, you know, all GLMs, all models, Gaussian, binomial, Poisson, Cox model included, multi-task linear. We also accommodate the elastic net penalty, which I'll tell you briefly about, which is somewhere in between, comes in between rich and lassi, um, and hydrous in between, um, can handle a very large um, number of variables, do cross-validation for all the models. Um, you'll see it's very, it allows for sparse matrix formats in X, often with these massive feature sets. The, the, the X matrix, right, the model matrix, will be very sparse. Right? This can be presence or absence of words in a document, things like that. But often when you have very big feature sets, they, they can be sparse, and we can exploit that. Um, and my present graduate student recoded all, the original version of Glimnet, written in Fortran, 
usually people start snickering when you say Fortran. Um, but Jerry Friedman is an expert uh, Fortran programmer, and he wrote all the internal algorithms were written in Fortran. That's how we got the speed. And just last year, James Yang, my um, PhD student, rewrote all of that in C++, and we actually achieved um, some speed-ups, especially when we came to copying big matrices. Um, and there's lots of things that coordinate center allows. It makes really easy. For example, you can, you can have upper and lower bounds on the coefficient values in the model. Often you want a positive lasso coefficients bigger than zero. Well, if you're doing coordinate descent, one feature at a time, it's easy to, to maintain constraints like that. You allow offsets, um, which you may have pre-trained a model on some other data, and you can put that prediction into the model, and then you add, use your local data to, to add additional features. Right? So that's, that's something that's, that's useful. Um, penalty strengths, you can penalize different coefficients more than others. Often we have a bunch of variables, some are demographic variables like age and, and, and sex and, and things like that about the subject. And then you have all the features that you really need to do the selection. Well, those variables, the demographics, you can put in the model and penalize through penalty strengths. You just say penalty zero on those. Um, and so all the usual options. And as I mentioned, some of very students learn their pi. Um, this is in collaboration with our colleague, Jonathan uh, Taylor at Stanford, who's a Python expert. Um, so that will be coming out very soon, early in the new year. Pretty much done. So let me tell you briefly about coordinate descent and why it's an attractive algorithm for building on that too. So you know, we've got, I'm showing you for, squ uh, for squared error loss. Um, so there's the problem, squared error loss. And we're going to, we suppose the predictors and the response are standardized at mean zero and variance one. Usually we do standardize the features in Lasso because the coefficients are treated as equals. Um, and now we want to do coordinate descent. So at any point, what we're going to do is, let's say we're going to update the jth coefficient. So we're going to freeze all the other coefficients. And this is the partial sum of all the other coefficients times their excess. So we form a partial residual. And then we compute the simple least squared coefficient of these partial residuals on that, on that jth predictor. And because of the standardization, that simple regression, the coefficient is just basically an inner product of the residual, one times one over n. Okay. But we still have to take the penalty into account. And so then we get the coefficient by doing what's known as soft thresholding. So from the absolute value of this data they saw, we subtract lambda and take the positive part. So that means you shrink it down towards zero by lambda. And if it hits zero, you set it to zero. If it's positive and if it's negative, you go up towards lambda and set it to zero. So you can do two simple operations, an inner product and soft threshold in. It's the exact update in coordinate descent. And then you go on to the next one and you keep on going around. When you get to the end, you go back to the beginning and keep on going. That's coordinate descent. So these two simple, simple operations, um, <coughs> the third thing I want to, one other thing is if the X is, if the X matrix I mentioned, we can expo uh, exploit sparsely. If the X, if a column of the X matrix has got lots of zeros, you're gonna store it in some sparse matrix format. So you'll just store the locations and values of the non-zero values. Well, you can imagine this inner product you can compute very efficiently then, because you only visit the non-zero values. Right? So I mentioned the elastic net penalty. So it's a blend between lasso and, and bridge. So this is one form of the penalty. Turns out the, the computations are very similar in coordinate descent. Same story, you get the, the, the least squared coefficient on the partial residual, and then you do a combination of soft threshold in by lambda, so that's um, by lambda times alpha, lambda times alpha, that's for the last two part of the penalty, 
And then a shrinkage that corresponds to the rich part of the uh, penalty. Okay, a, a scaling kind of shrinkage. It gives you the solution. And this is the picture for the elastic net um, uh, threshold. Both really simple. This is just showing you the effect of elastic net versus lasso on a, on a genomic data set. This is lasso, the, the path as we relax the penalty, see some coefficients become non zero and then they grow. Here's the elastic net. So, what I've lost over with the elastic net is there's an alpha that tells you how much ridge, how much lasso. Right? So, you've got two tuning parameters here. And what we see is for elastic net with alpha 0.4, um, it's behaving a bit more like ridge, so it lets in more variables but shrinks them all down to zero. So these are all meant to be at the same kind of stage in terms of how much fitting you've done to the data. And by the way, the elastic net, the idea was that if, if, if you've got a lot of correlations amongst case groups of variables, um, they tend to get selected in the model together. That's the ridge effect tends to do that. And this is pure ridge, or it has everything in the model, so it's got to shrink them all the way down to, to Achieve it's effectively the same amount of fitting. Okay, so that's the idea of, of, of GlimNet coordinate descent and fitting lasso models, elastic net part models for a, a really wide range of, of, of linear models and, and loss functions. Um, but people wanted more, so sparser than lasso. So I showed you the constraint regions for this lasso. And we went from the ball for ridge to the diamond for lasso. And it turns out that's as, basically as far as you can go and still have a convex constraint region. If you go any, down any further, you get to non-convex constraint regions. Um, and that lets you move. So, so from ridge to lasso, you go from L2 regularization down to L1 regularization. But here you'd like to maybe go to L0 regularization, which is L0 corresponds to best subset selection. Right? You select a subset and don't shrink them at all. And so in terms of penalties, that's what you're doing. You're moving down um, and, and getting concave until you just get penalties that would sit on the coordinate axis. So this is Rahul Mazumda, who was my PhD student. Um, and also the son of, of one of your, your emeritus professors here. Um, and um, he and I worked on, and with Jerry Friedman, on, uh, on the paper for doing um, regularization for non-convex families. Um, and it was known as the MC plus penalty. And we have a packaging R called sparsing. And that, that's pretty fast as well. Now, um, I mentioned that because there's been a lot of recent work on best subset selection. Okay. Um, so I mentioned so best subset you can you can frame it as fitting say v squares with an L zero constraint on the on the coefficients, which this is gonna what this is gonna do is it's equivalent to saying the number of non-zero coefficients is no more than k. The non-convex optimization problem generally is NP hard and and solvable for exactly for P around under around 40. Okay. So again, Rahul Mazumda, that smart ex-graduate student of mine, who's now professor, um, associate professor at MIT, um, he with Bertsinus and King came up with a way to crack this 40 old problem and um, best subset selection bottleneck. And uh, and the algorithm uses a technique known as mixed integer um, optimization. And uh, what they're able to do is track the duality gap. Oh, sorry, you get yeah, the duality gap. And they're able to report exactly if it ever hits zero, right? And, and, and if that happens, you know you have the exact solution. And this is for much larger P. Um, but they can also report how close it is to zero. 
Okay, optimizing that. Um, the computations are still slow, but you know, this is going from not being able to do it at all to, to being able to do it um, in, 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 in time that uh, is still manageable. So this raised the question because a certain community, um, in particular Bert Seamus and, 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 and people at MIT, they felt that this whole lasso story was just a computational approximation to best subset selection and L0. They said, if you can do L0, then of course you do it, right? And if you can't, then you'll use lasso because that's the, you know, that's the, um, con the, the tightest convex relaxation of L0. Okay, so that's the only reason you'd use lasso. But now with these breakthroughs, we should move to best subset solution. So Rob and I bristled a little bit at this, and we thought, no, we don't actually believe that's necessarily true. So we wrote, we did an extensive simulation. This is Rob Pipsharani with his son Ryan Pipsharani. This photo, if anyone has, knows or has heard of Ryan Pipsharani, he's approximately uh, 35 years old and he's a professor at, at UC Berkeley now. So this picture was taken a little while ago. Um, so we wrote a paper um, that compared um, best subset using these new fast algorithms of um, with lasso and variants of lasso on a variety of, of, of different problems, right? And I'll just summarize the conclusion. Um, forward stepwise is very close to best subset, but much faster. So if you really want subset selection, best forward stepwise usually does the job really well. In wide, in wide data settings and low signal to noise ratio, which by the way is often what we find in real, you know, like especially in medical applications, low signal to noise ratio. That too can beat their subset and forward stepwise. So the shrinkage of that too is important. And there's something called relaxed that too, um, can, in our experiments was for the uh, overall winner. So this just gives one of our simulation examples. Here we see, this, this is expected prediction error. This is, um, best subset is red, forward stepwise is green, and lasso is, is blue. And small is good here, and this is indexed by subset size. So here's an example where lasso actually outperforms um, both best subset and, and, and forward stepwise. Um, what came up in this work as well is, um, and it, it's, is the notion of effective degrees of freedom. So we know when you fit a linear model with p variables um, by least squares, for example, we say we use p degrees of freedom. With Lasso, it turns out, and this was discovered initially by, in, in the last paper with Brad Efron, um, that. Uh, the degrees of freedom, effective degrees of freedom of the lasso is the size of the active set, the number of non-zero coefficients. Which was a surprise when it first came out because you're hunting for the, you know, you're doing a search for these coefficients in the model and you should pay a price for the search. But then when you get the coefficients, you do shrink them down to zero. So you compensate exactly for the greediness of the search by shrinking a little bit towards zero. So the degrees of freedom is again exactly the number of coefficients in the model. And this shows that the, the degree, effective degrees of freedom for best subset and for stepwise are much higher um, and, um, and, um, than for, than for the suit. <laughs> Okay, well, relaxed lasso is, is an idea, it's a simple idea. You fit the lasso regularization part, which includes a sh shrinkage of the coefficient. But then in each of the steps, you take the active set and you fit a new model with those variables unregularized. So you relax, right? And, you know, and then that becomes a new path of solutions and you can use selection cross-validation to, to select those. Easy to do. 
Right? And then you've got a lot of variables. That SU does selection for you, and now you 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 debias them basically. Right? And we in fact have a way of, of, of doing it. But we, we, this is the debias version. This is the SU version, and we add another parameter which lets you go part part of the way to relax. Because it's easy to do. And in this example, I showed you that um, relax that to selected ended up using a smaller number of, of variables and did slightly better. So this all came up in the context of that um, of that little um, comparison of, of with this subset and okay. So I mentioned. Um, I mentioned that uh, it was easy to compute lambda max. Lambda max is the smallest value of lambda for which the coefficients are still all zero. Um, well, it turns out the way you can compute it is you just, usually the intercept's not penalized in the model. So you put the intercept subtracted from y. Um, this is for logistic regression, but it works for, for any of these models. And then you compute the inner product of each x with that residual vector. These are vectors, right? N vectors. And this is in the context of a G wallet, but you compute this inner product um, for each of them and take the absolute value, and the maximum of those is lambda max. So it's a very simple thing to compute. So, but now I'm telling you in the context of screening rules. So, So the idea is you do that, that tells you who's going to come in the model first, but it also tells you who's likely to come in fairly soon afterwards, right? Because the ones with large inner product to that residual are likely to come in soon afterwards. So the first idea was for, for GWAS, where you've got maybe a million SNPs, compute those inner products, take the top 1,000 of them, and fit the exact lasso solution on those. And then... At the values of, of the path, you're going to do it on a grid of values of lambda. You've got these solutions. You can then easily check if those solutions are, in fact, the exact solution for, in the context of all the features, right? So it's a, it's a screening rule to try and hedge on the computations and hedge on and, and guess what the active set is. So that led to, to some work with, um, with Robert Giovanni and, and other uh, colleagues of ours. Um, at, at Stanford and students um, called the strong rules. And it's a refinement of that idea where as you're going down the path, you do get continuously. And here's something nice for the lasso, for, in this case, again, for square level is that for a given value of lambda, if beta hat is the solution, then this is the residual, right? This is the residual vector. A property of the solution is that the inner product of this residual with xj is exactly lambda if j variable j is in the active set, and it's less than lambda if it's if it's not. Okay. So that's a property of the solution. So the point is that again, that variables that are nearly in the active set will have inner products with the residuals that are nearly equal to lambda. Right? They're sort of knocking at the door to come into the model. So the idea of the strong rules is that you look a little bit down that list and 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 consider those variables who, whose inner product with your current residual is close to lambda. Those in the active set are exactly equal to lambda. Look at those knocking at the door to come in and you confine your, your coordinate descent algorithm just to them get the exact solution, then you check again to see if this is the exact solution on all the variables. And those are simple checks. So here's a picture of, of, of screening rules. So this, the num this is a, a simulation of the number of variables in the model, the number of predictors after filtering. Right? So this is the exact number in the active set as you fit path of solutions of lasso. Using our strong rules, these are the number of variables that we actually considered. 
This this is not here. Yeah, this is on the linear scale going up here. Um, and there's another uh, a rule there. And in this case, there were um, 1,200 variables, right? And you can see that we only need to consider with a much smaller subset as we're going on. You still get the exact solution. It's just the, the heads, computational heads. So using these ideas, um, we then exported um, that and, and, and the, the ideas of doing this fast fitting um, onto analyzing GWAS, so genome-wide association studies. And one data set that's very popular for doing that is the UK Biobank, um, um, where you've got 500 to half a million subjects, you've got their, their genome sequence, and we have SNP measurements in this case of uh, 805,000 locations. So that's a big data set. Okay. And you've got hundreds of phenotypes on these subjects. These subjects have all allowed for their data to be used publicly. And hundreds of phenotypes, whether they've got asthma, whether they've got heart issues, different blood measurements, other things, demographics, height, weight, you, you name it. Um, um, and the idea is to build what's known as generally as polygenic risk scores. So you want to build, in this case, linear models involving these SNPs. So the SNP in, is a, a mutation, right? You've got, you've got a pair of chromosomes, and on each at a particular location can either be a wild type or there could be a mutation, right? And and so you got the, the mother and the father, it could be no mutations, that's a zero on either. One mutation on one or the other, that's a one, or both have a mutation, that's a two. So it's a zero, one, two variable. And there's 805,000 of them. And you want to build a linear model involving some of them that explain the phenotype, that predict the phenotype. So that, that's the goal. For polygenic risk for, and we, we built a, a, a variant of the package um, Lumet called SNPnet, um, which is on GitHub for doing it. So this, this shows you the solution part. Here we're actually using height. People often use height as one, because height is something that's governed by um, genes all over your chromosomes. Every single chromosome basically has something to say about height. Right? And we know there's quite a big variability in height in different populations around the world. And so this is showing you as a function of the lambdas, as we relax lambda, this is the R squared on a test data set for the prediction of height. And we can see that for, so the red curve is the lasso on the validation data set. And it gets up to an R squared of 0.7, which is pretty good. So it's just using genetic in information to exp to explain the variability in height, it's getting up to an R squared of 0.7. Um, that's on the test data. The black curve is, of course, on the training data, and that's just going to keep on going up, right? Because you'll overfit. What's interesting here is this is where like who maxes out? 47,000 SNPs involved in the prediction of height there. Um, the, the green curve is the relaxed lasso that I was telling you about, where you take the active set and now you refit un, unconstrained. And I thought it was interesting here, of course, the R squared of the relaxed lasso on the training data is going to be better than on the, on the, than the lasso itself, right? Because we're doing, we're not shrinking the coefficient, so that's better. But the, the, the validation performance of the relaxed lasso maxes out earlier and, and drops down and doesn't achieve the same performance as last week. So that's, that's, a, that's, that's a little bit of insight of, 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 of what's going on here. Um, when, you start, when you start putting too many variables in the model, you start overfitting. Right? So the relaxed last two is not regularizing, so it's aggressively fitting the coefficients a bit, you know, a bit more than last two. That's who is allowed to grab, reach out and pull in other in, important variables. And because of the shrinkage, doesn't pay 
quite as much cost for doing that, but it brings in more variables because of the shrinkage, and in this case, gets to improve its performance a little bit. Okay, so here's, here's some more numbers describing the result. This is just a picture of how we actually organize the computations because it's sort of the size of the data. We do a kind of batch group, uh, sorry, a batch strong rule where we go out with the big bank of data, the, the X matrix sitting out there. We can't put it all in memory generally. So we use the strong rules. We go and reach in there and pull in a whole bunch of variables. And then we put the exact solution on that bunch of variables. And then we go in again and check that our exact solution is correct and bring in some more. This picture is just bring in and, uh, and we make sure at the end of the day that our solution part is exact on all the data, but it's just how we do the computation. Yes, for asthma um, on the horizontal axis is the percentile of the polygenic risk score for asthma. Right. This is a presence or absence of asthma. So it's a logistic regression model. Um, and, and the orange curve, you can't see the label there, but the orange curve is showing the odds ratio for asthma in the actual test population. So it just shows that the polygenic discourse is, is doing a good job capturing that. Um, for asthma, again, a lot of um, these are the these vertical lines here are the Chromosomes, and you see a lot of chromosomes are involved with, with asthma. And here's another. And in terms of com comparison with, with, with other traditional risk factors, um, basically the polygenic risk score is much stronger than, than any traditional um, measures for. Um, So, I mean, we know this, our, our genome, you know, asthma is a genetic disease. So when we've got all the genome um, sequenced like that, we can certainly find um, genes that are responsible. Okay. Okay, so let's see, what's the time? We should be wrapping up soon. Yep. 10 minutes, okay. So it turns out that coordinate descent is a very general idea. And whenever you've got um, you've got a, um, a loss function, um, which is convex, and a, a penalty function, which is convex, we want R to be differentiable. Um, but the penalty, like for lasso, needn't be differentiable everywhere. Then coordinate descent is going to converge to the solution. And there's a, a well-known paper by Thing, 1988 that goes into detail. So basically, if your penalty can be broken up into a sum of pieces, and if each of the, the pieces um, is uh, on this, um, then you can do coordinate descent over those pieces. Yeah. But they needn't be um, non con they, they needn't be, so, sorry, they needn't be dif um, differentiable. Um, and each each of the terms, b j beta j, could refer to a set of coefficients. Um, that's going to lead it. We will talk about uh, group that soon. Group that soon is a, a generalization of that soon, where your linear model, you've got your variables set up in groups. There may be natural groups of variables, um, and and you want to penalize the coefficients for each group and keep them as a group. So then the generalization is to penalize the L2 norm of the vector of coefficients for each group. Okay. And it's not the squared L2 norm. And so that behaves like a lasso. What that'll do is it'll set the whole, select the whole group in or out. And if it's in, all the coefficients in the group will be non-zero and shrunk towards zero. So it's a natural generalization of lasso. Um, and it turns out you can use coordinate descent for that. And that same uh, student, James Yang, has just been working on a very fast algorithm for doing that. 
um, by the time I see the Chong's first layer as well. Um, then spot interaction models. Michael Wim was a PhD student at, at Stanford, graduated in 2014. And we used a, the, something called the overlap group lasso for, for selecting um, interactions in linear models. So um, that, that obeyed the hierarchy principle for interaction. So when you have an interaction um, of two variables, you want one of the main effects to be in the model. Um, mixed graphical models. Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, Jason Lee, who's a, a, one of my students, again, um, we used a group lasso for doing that um, and for selecting um, edges in, 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 in the mixed graphical models. For um, generalized additive models, there was another application for using a group lasso. So this is Alexander Cholakova. She was a student in 2015. And if you think of an additive model, you've got functions of an individual variable. So there is a function of xj. But often those functions are represented in a basis, say, of splines. And there's, so you've got a vector of coefficients. We use a group lasso for doing that selection. But we did it in a special way. So it was slightly complex, but we did it in a special way so that <clears throat> the selection points were either the variable was in the model and nonlinear, but if you shrunk some more, it would snap down to a linear term, right? So it would be in the model, but be linear. Or if you shrunk a bit more, it would be not in the model at all. So you had that transition between linear, between zero, linear, and nonlinear. Right? And then as you relax more, the nonlinear would grow and become even more linear. And something pointed, the son of Stephen Boyd, who did some um, work um, um, using something um, called saturated piecewise science. So, yeah, I'll tell you about it. Um, and then matrix completion. There's again Rahul Mazunga and Jason Lee. Um, so, matrix completion is this area, it's a fun area. Um, when you've got a big data matrix and it's got missing values in lots of places right? and you'd like to compute a low rank approximation. You'd actually like to impute the missing values, but you may do that through a low rank approximation. And, uh, and so you, you minimize the sum of squares of the observed entry from Z where Z is going to be a low rank approximation. And then there's something called a nuclear norm penalty on the matrix approximating matrix Z, which is the this, this sum of the singular values. And so that's like a lasso penalty for matrices. And so there's algorithms for doing that. So I'm just giving you a, a kind of list of places where sparsity um, has played a role. And I'm kind of using that time, so I'm going to just jump to the end. Um, there's our book. Um, statistical learning with sparsity with Martin Wainwright. There's a theory chapter in um, chapter 11, which, um, which Martin Rain Wainwright wrote. And he, he also wrote a book sh shortly after this book was came out called High Dimensional Statistics. And the whole book's about um, and theory and, 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 and um, looking at these models from a theoretical point of view. Okay, so to summarize, um, I talked about sparsity by convex relaxation, um, which is effective and, and computable. Um, although the last two is 27 years old, it's still very popular. But public software is essential. Um, Cohomer descent is simple and effective, especially when, when the models are sparse. Um, screening rules are very useful if, you, if, if they work in your problem, you can save, um, a, save massive computation. Um, there's many extensions to Lasso. I've just touched on a few here. Um, there's also an area called post-selection inference, which is a rich field, but I didn't touch on that here. So the idea is once you've done your selection, say through Lasso, can you now do your usual uh, inference, like put p-values on the coefficients selected and things like that. That's a very um, 
after the other one. And I'll end up with some cheap marketing. So these are these are some of the recent books that we we've uh, we produced. Right. So the, these are old ones. Uh, this is a book with Brad Efron. And then here's our introduction to statistical learning, the second edition with applications in R. And then this year we came out with the same title, but with applications in Python. And, and Jonathan Taylor was included as a, a, um, a co-author. And the reason I feel justified in splashing them up here is that all the PDF of all these books are freely available. In agreement with the, with the publishers. Um, also, there's, there's some courses on edX, which are, of course are also free. So there's statistical learning with, with R, and just a few weeks, last week, was added statistical learning with Python. And these are courses where we basically, it's based on these two books, we go through every chapter in the book, mostly Rob Tipshrani and myself giving lectures. Um, in the labs um, for the Python book, Jonathan Taylor um, mostly um, gave the lectures. Um, and so this, with that, I'll thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for your excellent presentation. <laughs> and uh, I hope the students sitting here got a good exposure on uh, all the computational details related to penalized methods and regularization, which uh, sometimes uh, is an issue for students working on this topic. So uh, since there will be a session starting soon after this, maybe we can take two, three quick questions from the audience. And I would like to have some questions from the students if possible. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. Just uh, uh, relating the idea of uh, the inclusion that minimizing the error plus the, the regularization. Uh, also, have some roots with the, the classic idea of linear prediction. Signals, uh, specifically the success of linear prediction from speech, also, and physical prediction. So, where we also minimize the linear prediction residual error. So, my question on is it that if we also can be considered to be an extension to the idea of consistent integration literature, where we do not have the regulation at all, we just minimize the ultimate of the error? Okay. So I didn't quite get that question. So can you clarify a little more? So you want to, you want to say a little more? So can you discuss the difference in the last um, further back, previous slide, further back, no, there was an error, there's no error plus regulation of the error. The minimization of the error, I think that was quite far back, right? The last page, yeah. yeah. Like there. No. Like there. Anyway, my question was that when we minimize the error, yeah. in this case, it is an end norm, plus there is a regularization term. Yeah. Whereas in the linear prediction, we, we minimize the error, of course, that is an end norm. So uh, I was trying to say that it's this the generalization of the linear prediction. Well, it's a, a generalization of the fitting method. So if you just minimize the, 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 the sum of squares of the error, that, that's what you call these squares. Yes. Um, but the problem is that sometimes when you have many variables, the coefficients are too crazy. They, they get high variance, which are over to the pretty. Right? So the, the idea of the lasso is to, is to shrink the coefficients towards zero. And in addition, if you've got too many variables, if you've got more variables than you have observations, you can't do these things. The models are the chest, right? Um, and 
you, you can't do these three. It's underdetermined by these There's infinitely many solutions, so you just can't do it. And they all get zero residual. So you have to do something different. Right? And so that's true, or regularization is one way to deal with that. Thank you very much. Anyone else wants to ask? Any? Yes, somebody at the back. Yes. Yes, there. Are you trying by my ear? By my ear. You'll fix it immediately. There is someone there. Maybe you can ask after him. Yeah. So the question is, uh, is regularization done in case learning and university layers and lots of things? They do. These algorithms, um, these algorithms that we learn in you have a way of humanizing each of the layers. Um, but honestly, I don't think they, they, they do, you know, they, they play around with that too much. Maybe they just have a default and into regularization. They rely on, on stochastic gradient descent. And that in itself makes a really good regularization part. Um, because as you, it's a slow learning algorithm, gradient descent is slow. And if you do stochastic gradient descent, you just use a subset of features each time, even slower. And so that gives you a, a, a regularization uh, part. It's actually not too different um, from, uh, from uh, quadratic regularization. And uh, the other thing that's different is that uh, with deep learning, a, a new problem they often work on, on problems where the signal to noise ratio is very high. So, for example, in image classification, you know, humans can pretty much get a, a di uh, classify every image perfectly. Right? Signal to noise ratio is very high. So, overfitting becomes less of a problem. But you can go all the way down to zero error on the training data and it tends to be the split solution. So the big which we have very few samples to train upon. And like when we uh, when we did our capture from a huge distance, I can't check what they do see with occlusion and all those features come into play. Rather than the SNRs are slightly lower and we can look at these techniques also mm -hmm. to figure that out. Yeah, one last question from this guy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, Actually, you try to tweet the problem of the number of variables. Yes, exactly. and actually, how can we compare the quality of the models with speed variables and speed plus one variables? Because you see that for, for the large number of variables, all measures like R square on the R square adjustments are useless, it seems to me. And you try to reduce the number of variables, but nevertheless, as statisticians, we should know how it is possible to compare. Just the models. Yeah. So are you saying how do you index them? Not 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 two models. Yes, with speed variables and three plus one variables. It's possible to say that the second model is better than the first one by some measures. Validation of the test data. The model that performs best on the test data, you can say it's a decent yeah. penalty for being better. Yeah. And one variable. It's by its nature of it. oh. the model was one more variable, better than the other. I see it. It's nevertheless. It's the the situations. And in the training data, it's the worst for being better because it's not variable. But on the test data, if you add too many variables, it starts overfitting at add. Involves variance, when you come to evaluate on the test data, you start doing worse. So that we rely on that heavily as a bias variance trade off on the test data. Right? You see that 
put too many variables in the model, you start using them. So that's the that's a, that's a, that's an important principle in, in the whole model. Okay, so this is the last question. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so some data uh, all some regression parts. Yeah, let's uh, approach yourself to tackle this variety of dependencies, master regression. You know, um, there have been, I mean, people have used that too in all kinds of applications, right? including in, in clustering, right? Can't be used by students to do uh, help with clustering. We have examples in the book. Um, but I think. The, the point is that your objective, you have to design an objective that sort of meets your goal. And then if, if appropriate, you can put L Latu regularization on the some coefficients in your objective, then maybe you can achieve it. So it's not like Latu itself can solve all problems. You have to design the right objective and 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 then you can introduce something like Latu to regularize. So I think you know there's no there's no simple answer. And for the particular problem you're talking about, I, at the top of my head, I don't know what's in. Okay, so Trevor will be around throughout this conference and beyond. So if people have, I'm sure people have many more questions for him, so they can ask him later. And because we'll be starting a session soon, let's uh, close this session with a big hand for Trevor. So we have a formal seminar. Thank you. Let's go.